Hello, I'm Ken Burrell from Pragmatic PMO. This is one of a series of videos expanding on the Success Stories Shared initiative started in South Africa by Linky van der Merwe of Virtual Project Consulting and Louise Worsley of Pi Cubed, and which has their enthusiastic support. Aldous Huxley said that men do not learn very much from the lessons of history is the most important of all the lessons of history. Project management research has shown that project managers prefer to learn from face-to-face -face interaction rather than from searching through lessons learned databases. I think that project managers can learn a lot from each other's success stories and even more from sharing their scars. So as part of my campaign for real project managers, on your behalf I'm talking to some real project managers I've had the pleasure of working alongside so that you can benefit from their experience. Today, I'm delighted to have with me Nick Hopkins, who started this whole idea for me with an article he wrote on LinkedIn along the lines of, Project Manager Wanted, Only Those With Scars Need Apply. So I'm hoping that he's got some meaty uh, scars to share with us today. Hi Nick, um, I'd like you to start if you can by introducing yourself and giving us a flavour of your background and how you got into project management. So I'm, uh, I'm Nick Hopkins, I've been an IT project manager for around 12 years now. Prior to that, I worked in IT development, so I come from an IT background. Um, I stumbled into program management, really. I didn't ever intend that. That's pretty common, I think, yeah. for a lot of people. And my background is insurance. Normally, I end up replacing the entire policy administration system, which is a fairly disruptive uh, process that can, that can run for sort of multiple years. And, and so at any given time, those projects could range from 20 to 250 people mm -hmm. at any one time. Part of the reason for me recording this series of videos was an article that you wrote on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, entitled something along the lines of project, management, project manager wanted, only those with war wounds need apply. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, and when I saw that article, I challenged you <laughs> Um, to share some of your scars, which you haven't done yet, so... <laughs> no, strangely enough, because I'm busy gathering more. Gathering more, <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. So, thinking back over your experience, um, can you think of, uh, of an example of a particularly egregious scar that you would have acquired from a particularly gnarly project? And what um, you where, where to start? The, the thing is, and, and, and you probably know this, Ken, there, there are so many, and you, you pick up so many scars along the way, but commonly they fall into to various patterns. There are multiple patterns out there. I, the cultural one's always a very interesting one because I sit in boards where the starter programs, where the board say, oh, everybody in the company is empowered to make change, they're empowered to make decisions, and then ultimately what you find is that that is really 100% the opposite because actually no one is empowered to make a decision or everyone is too scared to make a decision because of perhaps something that's gone on in the past and therefore you just again find yourself drowning in limbo you're just constantly kicking the wheels trying to get something to move but ultimately everything has to go back to the board and yet they're still going well, why why has this come back to us you know surely someone can make a decision and, and you just go well you have to address this culturally within your organization so what leads to that situation in which people think they're empowered but actually the hierarchy is quite rigid i think a lot of that often stems from not so much very big organizations because they have their own issues and, and, and hierarchies and structures but actually from companies that have started off very small perhaps even um, Often, and I've done a couple with fam almost started family run businesses 25 years ago that have evolved and now become these sort of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people company. But that level of culture where everything went back to the top has always existed. It's never gone away. And there's a lot of people who've worked there for many, many years. Yes. And so often that sort of level of behavior isn't necessarily driven from the boardroom, it's just driven from things haven't changed. Could it be because the company's grown by promoting from within? Yeah, and I think there's, there's always that, 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 that belief because with, with certainly with the, with the smaller companies or those sort of homegrown businesses, people do grow with the business and once they've been there a while, they're, they're comfortable so they don't go and challenge themselves. So what were the first symptoms you spotted that alerted you to the problem? I think there's a few clues. There's a couple of times I've walked in where here's, the, um, here's your team. Uh, they were involved in the last project, which didn't succeed for various reasons. Or, um, here's your team, here's, here's the approach, oh and by the way we just hired this 
freelancer in and he's gonna be my liaison to the board. So that's someone else as well as you? Someone as well as me. There's almost like this conduit. Once you find yourself in a situation like that, how do you handle it then? <sighs> It is really difficult. So I built a, built a good relationship with the go-between. So, you know, we used to go to coffee at half past 10 every morning, you know, and we'd physically leave the building and walk down the street to, to, to the coffee shop and we'd sit there for 15 minutes and, and talk about the day. Um, because actually I found that him on neutral territory, strangely enough, for those 15 minutes of the day was much easier to control. Right. And so actually all you're doing is just trying to find ways around the, the blockade in the road. And we did that a lot. And we actually made, to be fair, we made a fair bit of progress, but we could have done it a lot quicker. I think early days for me now, having done that one, I, I, I test the whole decision making process. I think it was one, one thing that we were, we were struggling with. And I, I just took everybody off site for two days and, and we put them in a room, through flip charts, did this, did that. How about this? How about that? And very quickly, you can see how the behavior is playing out you'll start to see who are the ones that aren't speaking up, who are the ones that are everybody's gravitating towards, mm -hmm. and where actually are the decisions being made, or are there not decisions being made? You know, are people sort of saying, yeah, yeah, we need to decide that, let's park it. You know, they're, 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 they're clues. Mm. Let's park that decision. Well, it's fairly fundamental to where we're gonna go. Give, a, give us a steer, give us a drive as to, 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 to what this is looking like, Clearly. because, yeah. Um, no, we'll come back to that. Okay, so let's just challenge on when we're going to come back to that because that's that's fairly fundamental. Yeah, then then you can start to see where the behaviours are coming okay. out from. So I think that's that that to me is quite key because because ultimately you need to know the people that you're you're dealing with. So it's about identifying the key players I in the team. It's about identifying the group dynamics of the team. Yeah. Who's leading? Who's following? Who's making decisions? Who's doesn't want to be there? You know. Um, that's that's really bad it. and and who's want, who who wants to drive this forward who wants to do the right thing okay so once you've identified those those key players and um, you're comfortable with what the group dynamics are then what identify the weaknesses and identify the strengths identify the decision makers and the power base and then use that to your advantage and and build the relationships with those people so they're the ones that you take to one side and just have sort of one to one with them and and go right okay look this isn't working what do we need to do about it are there is there anything else that you can think of scar wise that's really caused you problems in your project management career yeah um the big one where the stakeholders don't want change the the, the really big one where you're fighting against a tide of resistance okay and and that's much more difficult to, to to deal with because actually no matter how much you take people to one side no matter how well you build those relationships ultimately that resistance to change is going to impact what happens and sometimes that they are a little bit blind to that and and sometimes that's where as i said earlier you come back to these political clashes where really there's a them and an us you know it is doing this to us we don't, we don't want a new system we don't need a new system um well, well, actually you do because your old system hasn't been in support for three years and it's creaking at the seams and it falls over every Monday morning. But, you know, you don't need a new system. That's absolutely fine. That, that's much more difficult to manage, particularly is if that resistance is coming from much higher up the chain. It can be difficult when they're in a position of decision making and, and they do have final say on things. So then you can find yourself stuck in a limbo. Um, and, and spinning your wheels waiting for those decisions to be made all, all you can do is just use your steer codes and your, and your program management boards and, your, and your, your steering packs and force the decisions higher the toolbox just it has a number of mechanisms open and risks and issues actions um, you know even project finances actually we've got a whole team sitting here not able to do anything and it's burning you twenty thousand pounds a week you know because they're not doing anything need this decision so effectively the cost of doing nothing yeah, just the cost of doing nothing the governance forums where you're face to face around the table with your key decision makers and your key stakeholders if you're not getting any traction anywhere else that's your number one tool that's where you have to raise it. nick thanks for sharing those scars with us so today we've heard from nick about how he's recovered from things that have gone wrong on his projects Anton Chekhov said, knowledge is of no value unless you put it into practice. I believe the value of learning comes not from documenting the past, but from changing what we do in the future. So my challenge to you is what will you learn from this? What will you do differently in your projects as a result of Nick's experience? Let me know in the comments. 
If you enjoyed this video and found it stimulating, please leave a comment or a like or both or share it on social media. If you think these videos are useful and interesting, let me know and I'll make more of them. If you'd like to appear in one, let me know. For other videos on project management topics, take a look at my video channel. For articles on project management and PMO topics, visit my website pragmaticpmo.com or follow me on Twitter at pragmaticpmo. To connect with me more personally, search LinkedIn for Ken Burrell Pragmatic PMO. In the meantime, until the next time, thanks for watching.